differential equations of heat conduction in various coordinate systems. We, and specifically, we will look at the uh, equations in rectangular, cylindrical, and spherical geometries. We will also look at uh, cases, uh, conditions where we can simplify the equations because, in general, these equations are partial differential equations that are, would be functions of three spatial coordinates and time. So uh, when we can, we're going to try to look at uh, when these equations can be simplified and how we go about doing that. We're going to look at numerous uh, uh, examples and uh, homework problems to, so you can get you up to speed on how this all works. So here's our objectives. So again, we're going to obtain the differential equations of heat conduction in various coordinate systems. We're going to understand uh, multiple dimensionality and time dependence of heat transfer and the conditions in which they can be approximated as one dimensional. That's very important because these equations in their true form are very difficult to solve. Uh, but by uh, taking advantage of certain geometries, we can reduce them to a single equation and solve them using traditional um, differential equations methods. And finally, we're going to solve one-dimensional heat transfer uh, conduction problems and detain the temperature distributions within a medium and also what's known as the heat flux. And we'll cover what the heat flux is in this slide. So although heat transfer and temperature are closely related, they are different in nature. Temperature is what's known as a scalar. It only has a magnitude. While heat transfer has a direction and a magnitude, it's a true vector quantity. So since it's a vector quantity, we need to establish uh, a direction that's associated with both positive and negative. So here's the example we're going to work with. If, if we have a, a wall that's shown in green of thickness L. On the top slide, there's a hot side is on the left and the cold side is on the wall. So we're going to take uh, the heat that's transferred that's indicated by the red arrow. Uh, if it goes from left to right, that's, that's a positive. If it goes from right to left, then that's a negative quantity. So this kind of follows our directions of you know what, what we typically take. Uh, you can think of this as like the, the x-axis. So vectors that point to the right are positive, vectors that point to the left are, are negative. So again, we're talking about heat transfer. The, the driving force, that, uh, or the driving mechanism that causes heat transfer is the temperature difference. So the larger the temperature difference, the larger the heat uh, transfer. So in dealing with these cases, we're going to look at three coordinate systems that we're familiar with. We've got the rectangular coordinate system, shown here that's a function of x, y, and z, and t. So remember, this is a, a uh, heat transfer is a function of time. Uh, it can change. Uh, uh, we'll look at cases where it doesn't change. Uh, you know, that'll be one of the simplifications we make, like a steady state kind of case. Cylindrical is another, another case that we're familiar with. So you have R, phi, and Z. And then finally, spherical, which is R, phi, theta, and T. So to get started, one thing we need to distinguish is the difference between steady state and tra transient heat transfer. So here we show a wall that's shown in green, and at 2 p.m., it's 15 degrees C on one side and 7 degrees C on the other side. So therefore, this temperature difference is going to lead to a heat transfer through the wall from hot to cold. And at 5 p.m., we can see it's, it hasn't changed. It's the same. It's 15 degrees C, again, on the hot side and 7 degrees C on the other side. So we have exactly the same heat transfer through the wall. So in this case, the heat transfer is not a function of time. It's the same. So we call that steady state. On the other hand, the case below, we have a tan-colored wall. We can see here that the temperature difference changes. At 2 p.m., it's 15 degrees C and on the hot side and 7 degrees C on the cold side. And at 5 p.m., it's changed. It's 12 degrees C on one side and 5 degrees C on the other. So therefore, the, the heat transfer through the wall is going to be different at 2 p.m. and 5 p.m. So this heat transfer is really a function of time as well. So we call that transient. Another simplification we can make is 
if we know the problem has symmetry, oftentimes we can take our uh, general heat conduction equations, which are a function of three spatial coordinates and time, and simplify them down. So in general, the heat transfer equations are three, to three spatial uh, dimensions. So for the rectangular system, for example, it would be a function of x, y, and z. However, if we have some symmetry, oftentimes we can reduce them down to a function of just two spatial coordinates, or if we're lucky, we can reduce them down to a one-dimensional case. Uh, and that's sort of what we're going to start with, is we're going to start looking at cases where the problem has symmetry, and we can reduce them down uh, to one, uh, one single equation that's a function of one spatial coordinate and, and time. So let's take a look at this uh, case here, uh, as the author shows in, in uh, figure 2.5. Uh, this is a case where uh, here you have it's a function of, uh, he transfers a function of uh, two dimensions. So if you look at it uh, in any point in space, and let's take this, uh, since this is laid out on a uh, x, y, and z axis, uh, we can see here that the heat transfer is, is a function of x because you have heat transfer coming from here going through this side here in the x direction. You have a heat transfer that's, that's represented by qx dot. And also it's a function of y because you also have a temperature difference from the on this side. On the, on the back side you can't see it, so you have a heat transfer through the y-axis. But notice this problem has symmetry, so there is no heat transfer through the z-axis. So if we see this kind of situation, we can reduce our three-dimensional heat transfer equations to two dimension. Here's another case the author shows where you have a, a, a single window. So you have a temperature difference on the outside and a temperature difference on the, on the inside. Uh, and let's say it's uh, winter, so therefore uh, the heat transfer is going from uh, inside the house to outside the house. Well, if the, if the windows, if we can treat the windows as uniform, then the primary direction is from uh, in, uh, inside to outside. So this is a, a one-dimensional kind of case. Uh, in other words, the, the, the other uh, directions are, are negligible compared to the main uh, heat transfer direction. So what we're going to be dealing with primarily uh, in the case of conduction is what's known as Fourier's law of heat, heat conduction. Uh, and then one dimensional, one dimension, it's uh, stated as follow. Q dot, that's our heat transfer uh, rate, is equal to minus K. K is a heat transfer uh, coefficient that depends on what the material is made of, uh, times A, which is the area that we're transferring it through, times the derivative of temperature with respect to x. So this is a gradient. This is a temperature gradient as a function of x. So for example, if we plot this out, let's say uh, we put t on the, the y-axis and x on the x-axis, uh, we look at our, our wall or something we're transferring heat through, uh, the temperature is going to vary from uh, inside to outside of our wall. So for example, if the left side is the hot side and the y side is the cooler side, heat's going to be transferred from left to right through the wall. So if we look at the temperature uh, as it goes through the wall, uh, it's going to change from inside to outside. And, you know, uh, at any point, we're going to have a slope. So uh, the slope of this graph, the temperature versus position, through the wall at any point, that's the slope. That's the, the gradient we're talking about here. And uh, notice in this case, uh, the way we have it drawn, uh, the slope at any point is going to be negative. So now that we've looked at the one dimensional uh, case that was simply a function of x, uh, you know, dt dx, let's look at how we can extend that to uh, uh, a three dimensional case. So if we look at a, if we're inside a material at a certain point, uh, the heat transfer is going to be uh, the same on any isotherm. So what's an isotherm? It's a curve that has constant temperature. So if we're at a particular point, uh, the heat transfer is going to be uh, a function of uh, x, y, and z. So naturally, uh, we can write 
the general heat transfer uh, Q dot as a function of uh, QX dot, uh, QY dot, and QZ dot. So it becomes a standard uh, three-dimensional vector. In this case, we'll use Cartesian coordinates, but uh, you know, if it, if it was a spherical problem, we would use uh, uh, you know, R theta and phi, or, or for cylindrical coordinates, we'd use uh, R phi and Z. Uh, but you can see that uh, in three-dimensional rectangular coordinates, we're going to have a X component, a Y component, and a Z component. And here, notice that that uh, we have to use partial derivatives because the temperature is a function of uh, X, Y, and Z, uh, and T. So here, we have to be very careful. We have to use partial derivatives here. So we have a material heat generation, uh, as we have seen, is typically a, what's known as a volumetric phenomena. In other words, it, it occurs throughout the volume of the material. Um, therefore, you know, at a specific point, we can define what's known as the uh, heat generation rate per unit volume. And we denote that by the symbol uh, small e dot gen. And the units on this are uh, the watt per cubic meter uh, in the metric system, or it's the BTU per hour foot cubed in the English pound system. So if we know what the heat generation rate per unit volume is, we can simply integrate over the volume and obtain the heat transfer rate. So the heat transfer rate is measured in watts. So we're integrating out the, throughout the volume. Now, if uh, the heat generation per unit volume is constant, certainly we can pull this outside the integral and just integrate over the volume and obtain the, the total volume. So in most of the cases we'll deal with the uh, the heat, uh, the heat generation rate per unit volume is going to be constant. But oftentimes in the problems, the book will, will uh, uh, give you small e dot, and you'll have to calculate, calculate it. So let's take a look at example 2.1, the heat generation in a hairdryer. So th we're given that the resistance wire of a 1,200-watt hairdryer is six, 80 centimeters long and has a diameter of 0.3 centimeters. We want to determine the rate of heat generation in the wire per unit volume in watts per cubic centimeter and the heat flux on the outer surface of the wire due to the heat generation. So what we're given is 1200 watts. So that's that's the uh, big E dot gen. So that, remember, that's, that's in watts. Uh, we're told the length and we're told the diameter. So the rate of heat generation per unit volume, which is, again, the small E dot gen, is equal to 1,200 watts divided by the volume. So what's the volume of a, of a long wire? It's a cylinder, so it's pi r squared times L. So we put the numbers in, we get 212 watts per cubic centimeter. The heat flux on the outer surface of the wire is given by E dot gen divided by the area of the wire. So it's, that's 1,200 watts divided by the uh, outside surface area of the wire so if we look at it, a circle has a circumference of 2 pi r, so we move that through a distance l. That's the area of the outside surface of the wire. So you calculate that, you get 15.9 watts per centimeter squared. So thankfully, in many situations, heat conduction can be approximated as being one-dimensional. Uh, this is the case, certainly, if the heat generation is dominated in one direction and can be negligible in other directions. So some examples of this include uh, the heat flux through uh, the wall of a house, a cylindrical nuclear fuel element, an electrical resistance wire, such we looked at in the previous example, or the wall of a spherical container. So let's look at some more examples. So let's take a look at the heat conduction in a plain wall. So as I've spoken uh, in the previous slide, in some cases, the three-dimensional heat conduction equation can be simplified. So if we have a large uh, plain wall and it has a uh, density rho, uh, thermal conductivity K, specific heat C, and we have uh, a heat generation rate per unit volume given by E dot gen, then the heat conduction equation can be shown to be given by the following equation. Now our textbook calculates, uh, derives this equation for us, and you can look at the textbook if you if you want to see the derivation, but but what we're going to do is look at how to apply it in uh, certain cases and how to simplify it 
uh, in this particular uh, chapter to a one-dimensional kind of kind of case. So uh, one simplification we can make is that in most practical cases, the thermal conductivity K uh, is uniform throughout the volume. So we can take that outside the derivative and then divide through by it. And we can write the following equation here. Uh, here, alpha, uh, which is equal to uh, rho C over K, is the thermal diffusivity of the material and represents how fast heat propagates through the material. So this is the equation we're normally going to be dealing with in the one-dimensional case. So here's our equation we just came up with uh, through a plain wall, but uh, let's look at further simplifications. Well, first of all, if, if we have a, what's known as a steady state condition, that means the temperature is not a function of time. So therefore, this right-hand side is zero. So our equation reduces to this one. If there's no heat generation inside the material, uh, well, then the, this term is zero. So we, our equation reduces to this, this version. And if we have both of those conditions, where it's steady state and there's no heat generation inside the material, well, then it reduces down to a simple uh, differential equation that, that's easily solvable. So what happens if we have a cylinder? Well, we can go through exactly the same kind of uh, analysis and our textbook derives the following equation. Notice the right-hand side is exactly the same. And since it's a one-dimensional case, it's only a function of R. Uh, so again, if K is constant, we can factor it outside the, the derivative and then divide through by it. And for constant conductivity, our equation reduces to the following one. And again, if we can break it down into three special cases, you know, steady state case where the right hand side is zero, uh, transient no heat generation, uh, E dot gen is zero. And then you have both of those conditions and it reduces down to the following equation. We can repeat that analysis for a sphere. Here's our equation, general equation for a sphere. Uh, again, the constant conductivity case. And we can break it down into three cases again. Steady state, uh, no heat generation, and you have both of those conditions. So again, these are simplifications we can make. And so a lot of times you have to really pay attention to the way that the uh, problem is stated. Uh, you know, if it says it's a steady state case, well, then you can use this equation. If there's no heat generation, you can use this equation. And if they're both true, you can use this equation. So you really have to pay attention to the way the problem is stated to figure out which equation you can use. So one thing you can note by the, the you know, you can actually simplify it down for uh, all those equations uh, for the rectangular, spherical, and spherical. Uh, one dimensional cases can be simplified down in the following equation here, where you use n equals zero for the plane wall, n equals one for a cylinder, and equals two for a sphere. And of course, for the, the plane wall, it's, it's customary to replace r by, by x. So let's look at example 2.2. Here we have a steel pan that's placed on top of electric range. The bottom section of the pan is, we're told, is 0.4 centimeters thick, and it has a diameter of 18 centimeters. The electric he heating unit on top on the bottom of the pan consumes 800 watts and 80 is 80 percent of it is generated in the heating element and transferred uniformly to the pan. So assuming a constant thermal conductivity, obtain the differential equation that describes the variation of the temperature of the bottom section and steady state operation. So again, so here, you know, we're looking at the pan. The pan uh, bottom has a large diameter compared to its thickness. Uh, heat flux is applied uh, uniformly. So therefore, we expect uh, we could treat this case as one dimensional because its thickness is much less compared to the overall diameter. So our general equation for uh, heat conduction is given by the following. 
And let's see if we can further simplify this. So here's our general equation, but again, we're told that it's steady state operation, so the right-hand side can be set to zero, and the EGN term is also zero. Now, you know, some people get kind of confused. They, they think, okay, uh, you know, in this case, yeah, there's heat applied to the bottom, but if we look at the actual uh, pan itself, uh, inside the pan uh, wall, there's no heat that's being produced. So that's why this term is zero. So in that, in that case, uh, this equation, this term is zero, this term is zero, so it reduces down to a very simple differential equation. And here, notice we've replaced the partial derivatives by, by regular derivatives, uh, because now it's only a function of x. Example 2.3, key conduction in a resistance heater. Here we're, we're told we have a two kilowatt resistance heater with thermal conductivity given. The diameter is given and the length is given. Uh, it's used to boil water. Um, so assuming the variation of the thermal conductivity to be negligible, so in other words, the K term is negligible, obtain the differential equation that describes the variation of the temperature in the wire during steady operation. So here, you know, in this case, uh, you know, we want the, the uh, variation of the temperature in the wire. Well, the wire itself is producing the energy. So therefore, the E dot gen term here is not going to be zero. So let's see how we apply this in the next slide. Um, so first, we're going to treat the wire as a very long cylinder since its length is more than 100 times its diameter. Also, since the wire is uniform, uh, it's reasonable to expect the temperature to vary only in the radial direction. Otherwise, it's, it's a cylinder, but it's not a function of, of theta and um, uh, or I'm sorry, sorry, phi and, and z. Uh, so in that case, our equation looks like this. We're also told it's steady state, so the, that's why the right-hand term is zero. Uh, we can't get rid of the e dot gen term because again, that's that's what is producing the the the, uh, the, the power, right? But we can so we can calculate it. It's equal to uh, the total power divided by the volume of the wire. So it's uh, 2,000 watts divided by the volume of the wire. Um, so it's pi r squared L, but here we, we're going to use D and just divide by uh, by 2. And when you square it, you get D squared over 4. Uh, so this is the area of the, the circle, the, the wire, times its length. So you plug that in, you get 0.318 times 10 to the ninth watts per cubic meter. It's the E dot gen term. So here's our equation. Here's here's our e dot gen term, and that so given uh, suitable boundary conditions, we could solve this differential equation. Example 2.4. Uh, this is the last example we're going to look at in this uh, this particular section. We have a spherical ball. Radius r is heated to a temperature of 600 degrees Fahrenheit, and we take it out the oven to cool. Uh, ambient temperature 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, thermal conductivity is known to vary linear, linear with temperature. Assume the ball is cool uniformly. Obtain the differential equation that describes the variation of the temperature of the ball during cooling. So here's our ball. It's 600 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, outside 75 degrees Fahrenheit. We want to calculate the uh, heat flow. We want to uh, um, come up with a differential equation that we'd have to solve to solve this problem. So the ball is initially at a uniform temperature and it's cooling uniformly on the surface. Uh, so, you know, all points on the surface are going to be the same here. There's no reason to expect that it would be a function of, of any angle, right? So it's, it's, again, this is a one-dimensional problem. It's a function only of the radius and, and time. Uh, also, there's no heat generation uh, inside the ball, it, it was heated up to a certain temperature and allowed to cool. Uh, so the heat generation term, E dot gen, is zero. So therefore, the differential equation governing it is going to be just the sphere, spherical part uh, with the E dot gen term zero. Okay, I hope this helps you uh, Look at a few examples. Again, in these kind, of, we're not actually in this section. We're not actually solving the differential equations. We're just uh, doing the first step is trying to determine what equation we have to solve. 
Now, once we get the equation we need to solve, we'll have to come up with um, suitable boundary conditions that we can actually uh, solve these equations. And we'll do that in later later sections.